Well, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Um, a lot of heavy stuff in 1 Corinthians. It makes you, every week when I'm studying the next thing, I'm like, why do we pick 1 Corinthians? So many things that are, uh, make your heart ache, make your head hurt, make you wish you could get in your brain and scratch it. But Paul is working on the Corinthian church because they have a lot of problems, and he's dead serious with them about these problems. The way the believers there in the church in Corinth are behaving, it's not good. And essentially, so far, if you just read what he write, writes in Corinthians, they're not acting too much differently than the unbelieving world. Very much like the unbelievers. So he solemnly warns them. He warns them. This is heavy warning. I'm warning you too. This is not going to be easy. Not easy to hear, not easy to preach, not easy to study. Chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. He says, do, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, this is not just randomly thrown in there. It's not superfluous that Paul adds this into the text right after he talks about Christians suing other Christians, taking it to a public court to sue them in front of unbelievers. Actually, this is a proper piggyback a proper segue, a good link, a good extension to the situation of the Corinthians because they are suing each other. And if you even go further back, the Corinthians, he calls them fleshly, he calls them carnal, worldly. Those, that's the word that he calls this church. These are Christians in the church that he says you're worldly. So many ways. They were arrogant. They had the superiority at complex over everybody else. They thought they were better than everybody else. They thought they were wiser than all the other Christians in the whole world. And they were causing divisions with each other in the church over the leaders that they had in the church. Another thing, they were also letting um, the leaven, the corruption in the church spread because they weren't disciplining this man who was sleeping with his stepmother. That stuff was going on, and they weren't doing anything, anything about it. So they were, uh, there was gross sin going on in the church, and it's spreading. So that's where Paul's been, but now you've got this issue where they're uh, actually suing each other. He says in verse 8, we looked at this last time, Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Their lawsuits, their cheating, their defrauding, were characteristic not of true believers, not of a true Christian, but rather of the lost around them. Their motivations, their actions are way out of line for the believer in Jesus Christ. The way you act in carrying out these frivolous and petty lawsuits in public are typical of people who are not righteous. You're living your life in the world there in Corinth just like the people who don't even know Christ. Very unrighteous, very ungodly, very wicked. So much unlike people who are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying to the Corinthians. And then you get to verse 9, he's adding this to talk to them as a warning. And he gives this list, this catalog of sins, various kinds of sins, and they're all over the place. I mean, I, I wanted to spend uh, the whole sermon just listing all the sins that are there. Jesus said this in Mark chapter, five, Mark chapter 7, 21 through 23. He says, From within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly, all these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. And I'm, I'm really glad that verse is there, even though um, it's super hyper-convicting to me. It's hyper-convicting to everyone. This is a great verse that would convict everybody that they are sinners. I bet, I bet you got one of those things in that list that you do. 
at least in your heart, out of your heart. Because all of us have these things in our heart. These classifications of sins is something that all of us who are descendants of Adam have struggled with all of our lives. I'll just read it again. Evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly. You all got it. I've got it. I've had it since I was a kid, and it's still there. I struggle with these things. You do too. Now we're going to focus on the list that Paul mentions here in a little bit, but I want to give you a couple more just because they're everywhere. He says in Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21, the acts of the sinful nature, that's the acts of the flesh, your fleshly sinful nature are obvious sexual immorality. That, that phrase is in all the lists, by the way. Impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. A list of sins, a catalog of sins that people commit that if you're living like that, you're not going to heaven. You do not get to inherit the kingdom of God if that's the way you live. It says in Ephesians chapter 5, he says, For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person such a man as an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. That's the same thing that Paul's saying here in 1 Corinthians 6, the same thing. Verse 9 says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? He mentioned this about three weeks ago. He says this several times. Do you not know? It's a rhetorical device to say, Don't you guys no, you ought to know. These are things I've taught you before. Either you've totally forgotten it or you weren't listening when I taught it to you. Don't you know, like he said back in uh, um, two, verse 2 and 3, don't you know that we will judge the world? Don't you know? Don't you, do you not know that we will judge angels? Same thing here. Do you not know? Well, you do know, and you should know, and I'm reminding you again, you know. The wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. Wicked is the same Greek word that Paul used just up there in verse 8 where the word cheat. You cheat each other. It's the same word. You cheat. You do wicked things. And only here it's just a, a, a plural noun. You together do wicked things. It means someone who does wrong any violation of God's law, any violation of God's standard, or human law for that matter, anyone who acts unjustly, anyone who cheats, anyone who scams, are unrighteous people. It's the same word. You're unrighteous. You're unrighteous, and if you're unrighteous and you live unrighteous, you will not go to heaven. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what he's saying. You're acting unjustly. You're the ones who do wrong. That's what he said to him. You're the ones who do wrong and cheat each other. You're acting just like the ungodly. You're acting just like the wicked people around you in Corinth there. Your kind of living is completely contrary to a person who is righteous. You're not righteous. You're unrighteous. You're not godly. You're wicked. And people like that will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what he says. The kingdom of God uh, is a broad term phrase. It means a lot of things, but it's basically the sphere, the realm in which God reigns and rules in the hearts of men. A spiritual thing, a salvation thing. God rules, he is king over those who belong to him by faith in Christ Jesus. If you belong to God, if you belong to God, He is your God because you believed in His Son, then He is King. He reigns over you. It's His kingdom, and you're in it. That's what it is. And unrighteous people, wicked people, people who do not submit to His rule, don't go there. Do not get in His kingdom. Are not in it now and will not be in it forever. And all the things that are associated with that. 
People whose lives are characterized by ungodly behavior will not obtain. They will not gain possession of it. They certainly are not legal heirs to his kingdom. You know, there's no inheritance in it. It's not yours. Everything that involves, too, things like heaven. Now, I don't really know what's in heaven. I just know it's more than I, my wildest, greatest imagination can possibly think of. It's over your head how good heaven is. And if you're in the kingdom, you're going to heaven. If you're unrighteous, you will not gain possession of it. All the glories included in heaven, whatever that means, glory. I say this every time, I don't know what it even means. Just awesomeness, glory, the glory of God, light. The visible presence of God being with Jesus physically. Seeing him. Being able to touch him and hang out with him. Forever. No more sin. I, I, I relish in the thought of just getting to hang out with Jesus forever. I relish almost just slightly less than that, that there'll be no more sin to mess with me. be awesome no more pain no more sorrow unimaginable riches and unimaginable joy pleasure delight all the time forever 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 eternity that's all i know i don't know anything else but i do know this the unrighteous will not get it those who are not righteous will not get it those who live wicked lives will not get to go there. Do not get to have it. And Paul says to them in the Corinthians, to the Corinthians, do not be deceived. I think this is perhaps to me, I've been, I've been a Christian since what, 1987? How, how many years is that, 35 years? This is one of the scariest concepts I can think of. Uh, you think that you're saved, but you're not really saved. You're deceived. Paul says, do not let yourself be deceived. Do not let yourself be led astray. That's what the word deceive means, misled. I love this. The Greek word is plano. We get our English word planet from it. It means to wander. Don't let yourself wander. Don't be believing something that's not, that's not true. This is the worst thing ever, to think that when you die, you're going to go to heaven, and instead you're cast out. Does that ha ever happen to anybody? That's a serious thought. It happens to me. It happens to me every time I read what Jesus said. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me. Look at what he says. Evildoers, unrighteous, wicked people. Get away from me. I don't know you. I never knew you. I can't think of anything worse than people who stand before God on Judgment Day and say, I'm ready to go into heaven. And he says, get away from me. I don't know you. I never knew you. And you're like, what? I was up here preaching. What? I, I was doing, I was a Christian. And the reason why this is scary, it ought to be scary. I'm, I'm trying to make it scary. It ought to be scary because all of us here struggle with sin. We read a category, a catalog of sins, a whole bunch of them, and you go, ooh, that's me, ooh, that's me, ooh, I've got that one, ooh, I struggle with that one, ooh, that one's uh, got, uh, eat, eat me up all the time. Or is it just me? Pretty rough. And then I... I want to go back for a second because it starts to get so heavy. And I'm like, oh, Lordy mercy, I'd have to preach the gospel. Like we believe, we preach that Jesus' death on the cross covers every sin. 
Doesn't matter what kind it is or how many of them there are, Jesus' death on the cross satisfied God's wrath against your sin, all of them. We believe that, right? I preach that. Preach that a lot around here. I hope I never stop preaching it. His sacrifice, the Son of God on the cross, was for unrighteous, ungodly sinners. Whoever believes that, whoever believes him and calls on him, he saves. That's the truth. Don't ever change that. It's by his grace alone, through faith in him alone. That's the gospel. Nutshell version, but that's the gospel. We cling to that. We hold on to that. We've got to have that or else we're lost. All of us are lost. But then you have an integral piece of the gospel message that many times gets left out. I leave it out myself. Don't want to, not on purpose, I just sometimes don't want to deal with it myself. The command of the gospel is to repent. The command of the gospel is to turn from your sin and turn to Christ and be done with sin. And that becomes a lifelong thing. We sin, we repent. We sin, we repent. And I say, you say, I'm never going to do that again. I hate sin. I hate that it's an offense to God. I hate that it ruins my life. I don't ever want to do it again. I'm never going to do that again. And you find ourselves doing it again another day. You repent again. You do it again. Even though we're still wrestling with sin, remaining sin in our flesh, we resist it and we fight it. And our desire is to live a life that's pleasing to God. That's part of the gospel message too. People who know that they're sinners and know that it's a, a shame, know that it's an offense to a holy God, want to be rid of it. And someone who doesn't want to be rid of it, they're never going to call on Jesus to save them. They just want a, a ticket to heaven. They don't want to stop sinning. But the gospel is that God changes us. People who have seen their sin as an offense to God and have called on Jesus to save them, their lives are changed. It's a changed life. It really is a changed life. It's not the same as it used to be. It's not the same. Paul writes to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. He's a new creature. He's a new creation. It's changed. You're not the same person that you were. So you cannot go on living, and we talked about this many times when we were in the book of 1 John not too long ago. You cannot go on living your life in an unbroken, unrepentant pattern, a habitual practice of sin, and still think that you're truly saved. You can't. If there's no change at all in the way you're living, you're deceived. That's why Paul says, do not be deceived. I mean, do not be deceived means don't be deceived. If you're living a life that's completely void of repentance, no change of life, you're deceived. Don't let yourself be led astray and wander away thinking that you're okay when you're not okay. I'm, I'm, I'm really talking about myself, but I know it's everybody here. Y'all looking at me like, like, uh, you're, you're, like you want to crawl inside your skin and turn inside out. We are so prone to wander and think we can live however we want to and still be saved. We're prone to think that. We think that it doesn't matter what we do, how we sin, or how we live our lives, we're still saved. We believe in Jesus. We just keep going on with it. Paul's dealing with this very thing. What he says, verse 9. I'll read the verse 9 and 10 because it's all one big thing. I want to try to deal with it all together. It says, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now I mentioned back when we were in chapter 5, Paul mentions some of these um, in that one when he says, don't have anything to do with the uh, people who call themselves a believer. I'll read it. It's verse 11. 
Now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or a slanderer or a drunkard or swindler. And back when we were in that verse, I said, well, that's coming up in chapter 6. I'll deal with it more um, in depth then. So we didn't spend a lot of time on it back then in chapter 5, verse 11. But I want to work through Paul's list today. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each one, but it's, it's enough. The first one, and this is on every list that you can read, it's like this in the Bible. There are many of them sexually immoral. Now, I'm going to stay PG. No, nothing graphic, nothing heavy today. Just sexually immoral. It's the Greek word pornos. We get our English word porn from it. This means a sexually immoral person. Paul said in chapter 5, not to associate with someone who calls himself a brother, but lives like that. It's a sexually immoral person. Originally, the word meant to a, a, a prostitute. Someone who's a prostitute, you call them a pornos. But it really means, and it came to mean this, and this is what it is, does mean, anyone who engages in sexual activity apart from a marriage relationship. Having sex with anyone who is not your spouse you're sexually immoral. That's what that means. And man, this, I think this is, our culture pounds us with this. It's, it's, it's not just that we think these things. I mean, we think them all the time. It's, our lust, lust is all over the place. All of us here. If it, if it, I'm, at least most of us. Lusty people, lusty, lusty people living in a sexually immoral fantasy world in our minds. It's on TV, it's on cable, it's on streaming services, it's advertising, it's the internet. Even the PG stuff has um, sexually leaning content to turn your heart away to lust. Impure thoughts and things that go with the impure thoughts. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like, I think every single one of us, I'm, I hope it's none of us, but that would be dumb. I'm pretty sure it's all of us have struggled with this. Sexually immoral things, sexually immoral thoughts, a lie, um, just temptations may have been falling away at this point somewhere. But people who live a lifestyle habit like this, people who live a lifestyle habit, a pattern of sexual immorality, you're not going to heaven. You're not going into the kingdom. You don't get to inherit the kingdom of God. You're not in. If that's the way you live your life, if that's the pattern of your life, you're not in. Don't be deceived. You're not in. Paul mentions idolaters. Literally, that's a word that means an image worshiper. It's a Greek word. Uh, let's see if I can pronounce it right. Idolatres. We get our English word idolater from it. Isn't that cool? Just make an English word out of it. An idol is a pagan material image that's worshipped as a representation of a deity. This is the same definition I gave when we were in 1 John, where he said, keep yourselves from, the, from idols. Same definition. A statue, an image of something uh, that someone thinks is a god. They think it's a god. It's just an image. It's a statue. It's either made of wood or rock or uh, um, metal. And they worship it. They pray to it. They sacrifice to it. They pay homage and tribute to it. They participate in the rituals and the ceremonies that celebrate it. That's really what the idol means. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say this off the right since that's what an idol really is, I, I don't know of a single person, Christian or otherwise, who is a true pagan idolater. You know anybody that goes and worships a statue? No, it was very common in the first century. The ancient world, they had idolatry all over the place. Idols of every shape and kind and form and made out of all kinds of things with temples and priests and priestesses and all kinds of stuff going with it. They did that stuff back then. 
But an idolatry is basically opposite of worshiping God himself. You're worshiping something besides God. Ultimately, it's placing anything in the place of God. He alone deserves to be number one in our affections. And anytime you have something in your affections that replaces him as the first place, you're an idolater. I like Martin Lloyd-Jones' definition. I'll just read it to you. An idol is anything in our lives that occupies the place that should be occupied by God alone. Anything that holds my life and my devotion, anything that is central in my life, anything that seems to be vital, anything that is essential to me, an idol is anything by which I live, on, live and on which I depend. Anything that moves and rouses and attracts and stimulates me is an idol. An idol is anything that I worship, anything to which I give much of my time and attention, my energy and my money, anything that holds a controlling position in my life is an idol. So it's more than just finding you a statue that looks like something and bowing down to it. It's anything in your life that's just taken away your affections from the one true living God. That's an idol. And people who live like that, people who that is the pattern of their life, people who that is their habit, they're not going to heaven. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Pretty heavy. Adulterers, Paul says, I would say it's very similar to sexual immorality, except this is basically you being unfaithful to your spouse. Sexual immorality with someone other than your spouse, very similar to pornos, fornication, but this is just not fulfilling your marriage partner. Going somewhere else. People who live like that aren't going to heaven. People who are serial adulterers, not going to heaven. He uses the first term male prostitutes. You know, that's a... Uh, um, Greek word means soft, effeminate. Because I don't know any male prostitutes. I'm sure they're out there. I know they're out there in our culture. Probably in Myrtle Beach. But this would be, in the, in the culture of the Corinthians, uh, the, the female version of the homosexual. The homosexual who's the female partner in the relationship. Man, this is all over the place. It's more prevalent and prolific now than I've ever seen it in my whole life. It's the whole LGBTQ plus, plus, whatever, plus community. The alphabet people. I don't even know where to begin. Transgenderism is a thing. People think that they're not the sex they were born, that they're, that they're the other sex. And... How many ever varieties in between? Whatever that means. Because I only know two. The NCAA Woman of the Year is Leah Thomas. Rachel Levin, or Levine, I don't know how to pronounce her name, his name, is the Assistant Secretary of Health in the Biden administration. It's not a woman. She's not a woman. But she looks like a woman, not an attractive one either. Ew. I had to say that. And you know who started all this? Uh, Bruce Jenner. I mean, Caitlyn Jenner. Super genius, brilliant athlete. Maybe the best athlete that ever lived. Crazy. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I'm not going to keep going on and on. People who live like that, people who that is the way they live, are not going to heaven. Soft, effeminate men are lost. The other word he uses is homosexual offenders. Uh, there's only one other place this word is used in the New Testament, and that's in 1 Timothy 1.10. I didn't put it up there for you, but adulterers, perverts. That's the way the NIV tra translates it. Right next to the word slave traders. Nobody likes a slave trader, do they? But they love perverts. 
This is a person who actively commits homosexual acts. That's having sex with people of the same sex. And this would be, if you wanted to call the uh, homosexual relationship, this would be the dominant partner. The effeminate partner is the female version. This is the dominant version. Same thing. Originally, originally meant men, but it, it would include females too, women too. People who look like this are not going to heaven. They're not, they're not saved. They're, they're lost. They're going to hell. They're not going to be in the kingdom of God. They will not inherit it. It doesn't matter what society thinks or what society wants you to think or wants you to believe. God does not think it is normal. You're not getting in his kingdom uh, living like that. Paul used the word thieves. This is the Greek word kleptes. We get our word klepto from kleptomaniac, someone who steals all the time. And this could be either openly stealing something in front of your face or stealth, uh, you secretly conniving to get in there and steal. Cat burglar. An unbroken pattern of stealing. Thieves are not saved. If you're a thief, that's the way you live. You're not saved. You're not going to the kingdom of heaven. You're not getting into the kingdom of God. You're not going to inherit it. It's not yours. Paul says, neither are the greedy. That's someone who excessively desires to acquire more stuff, more and more wealth. It didn't have to be wealth, just stuff. Outrageously covetous. Never satisfied with what you already have. It's not happy with what you got. You got everything. You got all kinds of stuff, but you're not happy with that. You want more stuff. It's a lot of us, a lot of us struggle with that. People who live like that aren't going to heaven. It says drunkards aren't going to heaven either. Drunkards aren't going to inherit the kingdom of God either. They're not in the kingdom. This is a person who habitually drinks alcohol to excess. Intoxicated a lot. Now, I don't believe that the Bible teaches uh, abstinent teetotaler, total, I didn't say that right. The Bible doesn't uh, just prohibit drinking alcoholic drinks. I don't believe that. But it does prohibit someone who drinks a lot and drinks too much. People who drink a lot and drink too much aren't saved. Slanderers. Slanderers aren't saved either. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. So that's someone who attacks the reputation of somebody else to make them look bad to other, other people. They um, destroy someone's life and ruin their life and abuse people by their speech. Slandering someone putting them down, saying something evil about someone else to make that person look bad. Anybody do that? Anybody that's the way you live your life? You're not going to heaven if that's how you live your life. You might be sexually pure, but you slander a lot of people. You might not be a male prostitute. You might not be a homosexual offender. You might not be a thief, but boy, you start slandering people. That's the way you live your life. They're not going to heaven either. And then Paul says swindlers. Swindlers are lost too. It means grasping violently, seizing and robbing people by force, using pressure or some kind of ruthless scheme to get someone else's stuff, to get someone else's money. A scammer, like the phone scammers. They extort people. They embezzle. Con artists they advertise quality and then sell you a piece of junk. That's a swindler. People who live like that think they're Christian. They're not. People who live like that will not inherit the kingdom of God. People who practice these things as a way of life, as a pattern, as a habitual, unpo unbroken manner, it doesn't matter what you think otherwise. It doesn't matter what you think. People who live like that, that person will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
They will not receive a portion of the kingdom. They will not possess the kingdom. They will not partake of the kingdom. They won't get anything in the kingdom. They won't get any of it. People who live like this. Now, these are just a few of the sins that are listed throughout Scripture. Paul only lists this one in this text. These people don't get to go to heaven when they die. They're not, they're not raised with Christ. They do not have eternal life. And Paul says, that's what some of you were. I love this verse. I love this sentence, this phrase of this verse. That's what some of you were. Two things. First, it means that no matter what you live, your, what you have done with your life, or what your life is like now, or what, your life, what you were like before, um, irrelevant. God will save anyone of anything. I don't care what your sins are or how many of them you've done. That's what some of you were. Some of you Corinthians were like that. So it doesn't matter what you like, God will save you if you believe him, if you come to him and call on him and follow him and trust him. So it doesn't matter. That's what some of you were. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We go on and on, man. That's a whole sermon right there. God will save anybody from any sin. I don't care how gross it is. Jesus said every blasphemy and sin will be forgiven except the one of the Holy, uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. A even a blasphemy against the Son. Paul said he was a blasphemer. God will save people. He saves sinners. That, that's the only kind of people he saves. Unrighteous, ungodly, wicked sinners. So if you're one of those, you can get saved. The Corinthians did. That's what some of you were. You were these things. Secondly, it means that when you do get saved, God changes you to this new creature that he made you to be, the new man. You were like that. It means your life's not like that anymore. You were like that, but you're not like that now. You no longer live the way you once did. You know how many times that the New Testament says stuff like that? I'm just going to give you one. There are many, several references. It's like I, I want to, I'm going to run out of time because we're going to have the Lord's Supper too, and I want to finish this. It said Colossians 3, 5 and 7, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, pure, impurity, lust, and evil desires, and greed, same thing, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. That means people who live like that are going to be judged by God's wrath. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. You used to do that. You were like that. But you're not now. So Paul said, some of you were. And he'll save anybody, and when he saves them, he changes them. They're not like that anymore. That's not the pattern of their life anymore. That's not the direction that they go. That's not the habit of their life, these sins. Not saying we don't struggle with them or not saying we don't find ourselves flipping around and falling uh, back and forth from time to time, but you don't live like that. Now, how do you get from being all these things to, more living, a, to living more of a consistent, righteous life? Paul tells us how. Verse 11, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You were washed means... You were purified. You were made clean. You were bathed. This is an aorist tense too means but this is something that God did in the past. This has happened. This is a, a, an event that's already happened. You were washed. Your sins were washed away. Figuratively, it means you were forgiven of all your sins. God gave you a supernatural bath of regeneration. He made you alive when you were dead. He removed all of your sins from you so that they're not counted against you anymore. He says you were sanctified by God. You were set apart, dedicated to God. You were set apart to be holy to God. The word means to, be, to make holy. 
both positionally, he has made you holy before him, and progressively, he's going to work it on your life so that you become more and more holy. As you work on it, as he works on you, and practically, you just become more and more righteous. It doesn't, say, it doesn't mean you don't struggle with sin. It means you repent. You become holy. You strive to be holy. You're sanctified. Then he says you were justified. It means That word just means to be declared as righteous. God sees you in his sight before him. When you stand before him, he sees you as if you had never sinned one time. That's what justified means. It means to be acquitted, not guilty. Oh, what did he do? I don't know what he did. He's not guilty. He's acquitted. He's justified. Never sinned. Now, similarly, Paul says in Titus 3, 5 through 7, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. We, whom God has saved by his grace, whom God has regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon us and walk, living in us and moving us to believe and see his son and open our eyes and see his son and believe, whom God has set apart for himself to live a life of holiness. We, whom God has declared righteous in his sight, we inherit his kingdom. We're heirs. We inherit it. It's ours. We possess it. We obtain it. Eternal life. That's what Paul means. I'm going to close and say live like that. Don't live like the wicked. Don't live like the wicked because the wicked will not inherit the kingdom. Let's pray. Father God, we are gracious for your word, grateful for your word, that you have been gracious to us to let us hear it, to let us have it today. Lord, I pray, God, that you will uh, burn these words into our hearts and our lives so that we will live to be your people, changed people. Not like the wicked. Lord, rescue us from our sinful hearts. Rescue us from our flesh, from our evil thoughts and desires. All kinds. And use us to bring glory to Jesus. I pray it in his name. Amen.